plan. Okay, but now it's gone. It's gone now. So welcome everyone. We've got uh, we've had this morning um, a session with uh, uh, people from uh, uh, some uh, all over Europe, uh, plus quite some people from. Uh, uh, quite a lot of people from uh, India, Pakistan as well. Some of the uh, uh, some of the Saudi Arabia, other countries. And uh, today, this afternoon, as usual, we've got uh, more of our uh, South American uh, colleagues training for the uh, sessions, uh, and still quite uh, quite a good uh, European uh, group uh, joining. I'm still going to wait a minute because I can see the uh, the number are, are, are going up. So it's it's always nice to see uh, people joining this uh, this session. We started uh, uh, this series of webinar uh, a few years ago, three years ago. We touched on uh, a lot of different topics. Um, very often, you know, some of the latest development for procurement teams, and uh, this one is uh, particularly uh, relevant these days and interesting. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just going to start introducing gently myself. I'm Hervé from the IPM. Uh, I'm heading the research activities and uh, a number of uh, sessions we do for uh, CPOs and uh, uh, buyers in terms of events, uh, conferences, virtual conferences these days. Uh, quite, a, quite a few things. Um, EIPM, in a few words, um, school um, uh, with the ability to deliver program all over the world. Um, we've got uh, uh, branches and partners all over the world who support uh, large corporations who have uh, uh, programs in different parts of the world. And um, also uh, investing in the research side in order to stay very close to the uh, latest development and the most advanced uh, practice of the uh, profession. During the uh, webinar, um, please, you can use the chat. It should be on your right. You will be able to you know, ask any question. You will be able to put any reactions. Really feel free to um, put whatever you think is, uh, you know, is coming through your mind. And, we can pick some of the questions as we go, or we could be waiting um, a bit more toward the end to address um, some of these uh, questions. Um, I'm Hervé, uh, so I work for EIPM. I'm the head of research. And I will do the uh, opening context uh, setting. And today, I'm very glad to have uh, Patrick Carminati from uh, Lexmark. We will also share some of his uh, uh, vision and perspective on the topic, but also a practical case and some experience. Uh, thank you, uh, Patrick, for being with us. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks for the opportunity given to talk about a uh, subject matter, which is uh, important, as you mentioned it before and which is taking more and more importance for us as a procurement professional. Uh, and on top of that, it's a subject matter which is close to my heart, so I'm really delighted to talk about it uh, today. Thank you. So just as uh, positioning the, con the, the, the context, I think whenever we talk about uh, the um, environmental and um, social performance of the companies, what we've seen developing over the past years is a messy conceptual world. We have a lot of very smart people who have been coming up with a new concept, you know, whether the blue economy, the circular economy, the cradle to cradle uh, approach, the industrial symbiosis, uh, shared value creation with Michael Porter. And, you know, one of the most uh, used recently has been the regenerative economy. So on the one hand, it's really good because it's uh, showing there is a, a vibrant uh, contribution to better understand and tackle these topics. However, for practitioners, this is slightly confusing to have all these terms because we already had sustainability, CSR, and so on. So um, I think that's sometimes a little bit uh, difficult to grasp and also, they tend to be fairly high level, and we sometimes need something very concrete and practical, so we can we can work in you know getting into actions and making things happen. Uh, 
uh, we've decided to uh, focus on the concept of circular economy, um, probably because the word has been used extensively uh, over the last few years, but also um, because this is one of these topics where there's been some, um, some of the practical development that have been shared and, and we can you know, provide you with different tactics and strategy that have been developed in the context of the circular economy. What is a circular economy? I think let's start with you know, the other side of the uh, picture, which is the linear economy. In the linear economy, we take resources from the earth, we take resources from the ground, mainly. Uh, with that, we make product, we ship that to customers, and then the customer disposes of the product at the end of its life. Nothing, everything is going one way, nothing is going back at any time. If we were in a world that would really be a fully circular economy, there would be nothing taken out of the uh, ground, and there would be nothing that would be disposed at the end. Everything would be reintegrated within these uh, uh, economic loops, and we would have that circular economy. The reality, of course, is not one where we can achieve that kind of ideal that you have on the right, but the reality is more of we're trying to reduce what we take from the ground, and we're trying to maximize what we can reuse and recycle at the end of the life of a product or at the end of the life of a set you might have inside your company. So very often, circular economy has been associated with these three words, reduce, reuse, recycle, the famous three R. And you will see a bit later, the three R's have been extended to nine R's, but this will come soon. I think in order to really understand what we're talking uh, about in terms of purchasing contribution, um, there's three key strategies. The first one is to narrow, uh, narrow the resource flows. So using fewer resources, finding a way of taking less out of you know, the uh, environment, taking less out of the ground, taking less from Earth in terms in order to deliver, build, manufacture, uh, you know, any activities we have uh, uh, product. Then we need also to look at a second strategy, which is to slow down our use of resources. So we call that slowing the resource loop. And how do you do that? By extending the life of our products. Every time we decide to buy something that's going to have a longer life cycle, we might have, therefore, a positive impact in terms of slowing the use of resources. Closing, um, closing the resource loop is making sure, as we've seen, that we can enable the reuse or the recycling of sub-elements from the asset of the product when they reach their end of life. So narrow, use less, slow, use for a longer time, and close, make sure everything's possible um, possibly is coming back into the flow. Now let me go a little bit more into uh, further depths in terms of some of the tactics huh, that can be used uh, from, uh, um, let's say like, you know, you take a segment, you want to look at what are the opportunities you could be using in order to uh, implement some of the uh, circular economy uh, principles and practice. Uh, the first one is not fitting one category, but could cover uh, the, all the categories. This is to really rethink what we buy, rethink the business model, rethink the commercial model. It could be about transforming something that's um, sold as a product or sold as an asset to something that we rent. And this ensure that the product stays with the producer and they have more import opportunities to reuse, recycle, remanufacture, you know, some of these assets or some of these products. We could also think of sharing equipment or making the product more modular, for instance, in a way that we can enhance uh, their full uh, life. And uh, 
yeah, there's quite a number of options in terms of rethinking. And this is the most complex uh, aspect, probably, because we are going to integrate different levers from the other groups. Narrowing, um, the idea is fairly simple, refusing to uh, take something uh, from uh, the ground, from the earth, eliminating uh, some of the resource used by um, better using existing assets or by finding some alternatives, reducing, uh, 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 maybe in some ways using alternative uh, source that are taking less from the ground, uh, preferring to use something for longer time instead of um, having something that you can throw away immediately. Uh, but also uh, ensuring that we use biodegradable or material that can be easily recycled, uh, avoiding to use very uh, scare, uh, scarce materials or um, anything that's going to use a lot of energy and water. So that's purely about the specs trying to make sure that we can have specification that help to narrow. Um, what else? Uh, if we go to the next part, slowing down. Slowing down can mean repairing, uh, extending the life of an asset or a product by maintaining, repairing, upgrading, making sure this is easily done so you know we can extend easily the life. Refurbishing, like having a tap back option in a contract. So uh, a piece of equipment goes back, for instance, to a, a supplier, so it can be refurbished or upgraded. Uh, reusing, uh, making sure, for instance, that uh, some of the packaging can be you know, used on a continuous basis inside the flow instead of being thrown away after you use them, or give or sell the asset or some of the parts to another company so it can have a second life. Finally, repurpose, um, which is really using something or a subsystem with a different uh, purpose. Uh, the picture I always take for this one is, you know, the, uh, when you have a tire and you end up making shoes out of a tire. That's not really, uh, you know, what we do in industry, but uh, that's just kind of giving a second life uh, to some of the products. The uh, last two tactics, um, classic recycle, um, making sure that the asset can have material that can be easily and effectively recycled or recovered by turning the waste into some energy. I think uh, getting into actions called for uh, a number of things, making sure we have a very open mindset in terms of looking at opportunities. So if you want to screen a segment, get some buying from a few people in the organization to spend a little bit of time to investigate opportunities be systematic in trying to look at all the different levers we've just discussed be open in terms of uh, the new ideas coming in um let's not you know say i won't work we've never done that just try to give it a chance we are looking for options we're not looking for solutions work with stakeholders, get input from suppliers, list some opportunities. When we have a portfolio of opportunities, assess their feasibility and impact, we are still thinking in this is an option. Let's look, collect data. Very often, we are going to map the flows. We are going to map the life cycle, try to understand all the impact, try to understand what would the solutions that we've been identifying as opportunities could do to all these impacts. Um, in order to implement this type of solution when they're getting a bit complex, then the, uh, the idea is often to perform a TCO analysis that really help us to speak with data and make sure that we can uh, you know, be clear in terms of the economic uh, implications and decide on the actions if we've got something that's uh, um, you know, working uh, nicely, both in terms of economic, environmental, and social performance. Implement is often requiring, if we need to rethink, do things differently, to explain, 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 follow up on the implementation, and after, uh, communicate about the solution, uh, sell the project so you're creating more people who are uh, interested in pushing for this type of topic. And you can expand and go uh, further 
in terms of development of a circular economy. Patrick, I think now it's time for me to give you the hand and to uh, you know, let you uh, uh, share some of your um, experience and cases you've been working on on this topic. Thank you, Ave. Thank you very much for this very good uh, and for uh, introduction on, on circular economy. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, so, hi everyone. For the one who do not know me, I'm Patrick Carminati. Uh, here on this slide, you have much more details. I won't go through, through these. This wouldn't be uh, fully relevant for our session today. In few words, I would just say that I'm usually passionate about the green agenda and a strong believer that it can work well in a commercial PL environment. In other words, circular economy goes well with profitability. And this is what I'd like to show you for, for a case study, uh, for a real case uh, that I've been involved in. Uh, so my purpose today, uh, I would say there are two purposes. One is to really share with you an experience related to both procurement and sustainability. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I have the ambition to, to trigger some questioning for you, uh, knowing that uh, going through a case uh, is meaningful on one hand, but each of us in our industry, in our own role, in our company, we, we face different challenge. So replicating things may not be that easy. So at the same time during this presentation, I'd like to trigger some, some questioning uh, for you and for your benefit. So the agenda I do propose is the following, to first go through the sustainability principle uh, and spend a bit of time on a, on a definition uh, and to ensure that we are aligned on what we are talking about today when we talk about sustainability, see how procurement and sustainability uh, can fit together, then go for the circular economy principle, and then through the, through the case I've been involved in. So, um, before starting, if you can make sure to have a pen and a, a piece of paper or a notebook or something, you can take notes. Uh, I will be questioning you, uh, no need to answer through, uh, through click meeting, just take notes for you. It will be personal. Would you want to share some of your findings? Uh, feel free to do so. We'll have some time with the question, uh, with the Q and A answer at the end of the session. If not, this is mainly for you, uh, to hopefully, uh, make some more step on the circular economy path. And any question I mentioned by Hervé, do not hesitate. If there is a hot question, uh, do not hesitate to put it in the comment area and, uh, and they will interrupt me. Um, so before starting, I'd like to, to put you in a mindset where you will step back from your day-to-day -day activity. I know it's Friday, Friday morning, afternoon for some of you. Uh, let's try to step back from our paradigm and our day-to-day -day, uh, activity. And therefore, I put together two slides fairly easily and straightforward. The first one is a, is a famous uh, Albert. Uh, I guess everybody knows about him, uh, a genius uh, for me and for many people. And where I like uh, this person is he, he's been inspiring with many sentences quote that he put together and one of them is about imagination where he stated that imagination is more important than knowledge uh, and what i propose you is for this session just to connect with your imagination your creativity the one that you had what we all had when we were a young children where everything was possible just try to reconnect with this piece of your of yourself and the second one is this one. Uh, this is a magic glass. So some see it half empty, half full, or you may see it and say, well, what should I put in to make it full? What I do propose you for today is to look at it as being half full and to see what's in. And in your own world, own situation today, to look at what's in and not what's missing. And seeing things this way, determine what you can expand or replicate. Even if it's small, 
it is always better than nothing. And it is always more easy to replicate and expand things than adding things or reinventing things, if I can say. So let's now move to the sustainability concept and put a definition on sustainability. Here on the screen, you have two definitions. The first one is coming from the dictionary, pretty high level and vague. Uh, this is my opinion, at least. The second one, I think, is more inspiring and is coming from the first, uh, the former first minister of Norwegian, of uh, Norway. And I guess most of you knows about it. And it states that sustainable development is a development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And when you think deeply about it, uh, it's really a, a very inspiring sentence, in my opinion. So having in mind this definition, having in mind the glass and the what's in, and reconnecting to your imagination and creativity, I do propose you a quick exercise. And again, this is just for you. So take your pen, the notebook, and just very quickly answer this question. On a scale from one to 10, 10 being the highest rate, how important is sustainability for you? If it's highly important, it will be closer to 10 than one. And do not think about it too much. Just quickly, what the numbers pop up in your mind? Then, what am I doing today toward a sustainable world, both personal and per professional life? What am I doing? Just put a couple of bullets for each things. Whether you recycle things on your personal life, whether you do your best to choose a product when you buy it, uh, what are you? Never mind. Just put a few bullets on what you currently do. And these actions ask yourself the question whether it drives satisfaction or not. And assuming it drives satisfaction, what kind of feeling it gives you? What kind of feeling do you have when you have the satisfaction of doing something toward sustainability? toward a sustainable world. Assuming there is no satisfaction on both actions, what would you like to change so it can bring satisfaction? Think about it and take some notes just for yourself. Next one, how can I leverage what I currently do? So you are doing few things, well, I guess all doing few things towards sustainability. What more can I do? What can I expand? What can I replicate? In other words, this is a glass half full. And lastly, what else can I do? What can be my next step on the path to circular economy on both my personal and professional life? So just food for thought for you uh, and maybe to be used as a help or support moving forward. So now let's, let's see how procurement fits or doesn't fit with sustainability and whether it's a challenge or not. First thing first, let's have a definition on sustainable procurement. I found one from SIPS. Uh, which is on the screen here. The first time I read this one, and I give you a few seconds to read it. I guess you, you read it now. The first time I read it, I've been shocked. I've been shocked because of the last words, the last sentence. Words min minimizing damage to the environment. And I say, how me, a procurement professional, environment being close to my heart, how is it possible that I am damaging the environment by my actions, by my professional action? And stepping back, I did realize that in most, if not all of the cases, yes, there was an, an impact on the environment. 
and the negative impact on the environment in what we do in procurement. And I made a conference with a CIPS representative in the room. I also challenged him that this definition, this definition should be changed to, to be more ambitious and not only minimize the damage, but just to remove the damage, to not damage the environment. It may be ambitious, but I think this is what we, we have to, to shoot for, what we have to target. But at least we have a definition here, which can be used as a basis for determining what sustainable procurement is. So now let's see how procurement and sustainability can fit together. So these are open questions just to pop up thoughts in your mind. I do not have the answer. I won't give any answer. You'll see in the, uh, in the course of the presentation, I guess you'll, you'll understand where I'm coming from and how I do position on this uh, question. But I think it's more important for you to determine how you position yourself. So what's important in procurement to achieve cost target or sustainability target? Can sustainability drive cost savings or must sustainability generate cost saving? What are procurement boundaries? What is procurement ownership? What are the boundaries of procurement as it relates to sustainability? And here the answer is different from one role to another one, one organization to another one. And these boundaries, do they depend on procurement? Does it depend on individuals? Does it depend on organizations? Who owns sustainability in a company ultimately? Is it EHNS, sustainability department, all departments, everyone? These are the kind of question I ask myself when I start being involved in sustainability project. Because it was close to my heart, so I start approaching people from our sustainability department. This is the way we are organized at, at Lexmark. But quickly, uh, this question pop up and uh, I face some challenge to answer uh, most of them, I, I would say. So now let's jump into the circular economy principle and concept. So you, you heard from, um, from Hervé what circular economy aims uh, for. And you also heard from Hervé that there is a, there are messy conceptual words. Uh, I would say that circular economy for the reason I will uh, mention afterward is one of the, of the most popular these years. And I do see this as not being a, a sort of fashion, but this is a really a strong trend moving forward. And I explain why uh, I have this vision. This is a definition for the, from the European Commission uh, on Circular Economy. So I highlighted, I underlined here two points. The first one, which is talking about durability. The aim of circular economy is to ensure that the product, the resource is maintained for as long as possible. And Hervé mentioned that in his presentation as well. But then when the product end up to at its end of life stage, so it can't be used anymore, reused, refurbished, remanufactured, to ensure that the resource the product is made of can be used again and again to create further value. And further value is not just to put everything in a furnace to create energy, is not to put everything in landfill and wait centuries that things will dissolve by itself. It's really to create value. And all this with the background of economical and environmental issue that we are all aware of, especially these days, as well as resource scarcity and global warming. I would add that there is a growing interest in Europe. Why? If we just go backward on the definition, if you look at this definition, I think it's a very smart one because 
It talks about environment, bottom line, but it doesn't mention environment at all. It is the other way around. It talks about economy. So when you talk to politicians, to industry, to finance people, to shareholders, you get more traction from them when you talk about economy rather than environment. Because for decades, there has been so many initiatives on environment with the success we all know, uh, mitigated success, that it, it is not appealing anymore. But this concept of circular economy is really appealing to those people who has the power to potentially take action to initiate changes. So growing interest in Europe, I will say, I'm mentioning uh, from our politician, I have the, the chance and the opportunity to, to make conference and to participate to conference uh, throughout Europe, around Europe, as well at the EU Parliament in, uh, in Brussels. And I can tell you that there is a strong interest for, from those people because of the job creation linked to circular economy, but also the raw material dependency that Europe especially has uh, on those material, but not only Europe. This is true from, from most of the country uh, around the, the world. And also because of the economical impact uh, that circular economy has or can have. Then from industrial, because there is a customer demand, and also uh, it's a marketing tool uh, to market ourselves on how good, or not, but how good we are towards circular economy or such kind of a subject matter. And then various play players, many NGOs are involved and are very active uh, as it relates to circular economy. So this is why I do see this as being uh, an important subject matter for us as procurement professional. And this is here, in my opinion, uh, looking backward, I do see this as being lasting for years and not disappearing in a couple of years. So now I'm back with a question for you, bearing in mind this definition of circular economy, looking at your professional environment, just take a few seconds to think about how your company or uh, how this concept apply in your company, in your role. And this is just for you and this is unique. And the reason I'm asking this question is me before being involved in circular economy project as a procurement professional, I had a very little clear understanding of what Lexmark was doing. I knew that we were having a program, we were doing something, but I knew very few. And then I pulled the rope. I've been surprised to see everything we were doing. So think about how your company is involved in circular economy or how this concept apply or can apply. Okay, so now time to jump into the, the case that uh, I mentioned at the, at the beginning of my presentation. So I will try to use I or me, which I'm not used to, to, to help you better understand or as much as possible the role I did play here as a procurement professional. Uh, and for potentially um, trigger some thought on what role uh, you could also play in various projects you are involved in or you could be involved in. So the product I will talk to you about today uh, is the supplies. So I haven't talked about Lexmark. If you want to know more about Lexmark, you go on lexmark.com. In very few words, we are a printing solution provider for the industry. In short, we provide businesses with printers, uh, laser printers, and associated supplies, what we call supplies are also cartridges, also called toner. And this is the last product that I am talking about, the toner, the cartridge, or the supplies. Interestingly, this product, when considered as empty by a customer, so the customer removes the, the product from the printer and change the product because it's out of ink. This product is made of 80% plastic, 15% metal. Nothing we do not know how to recycle today. We know how to recycle metal for centuries, 
plastic for decades. And guess what? Happen what happened? With our 2015 data, I haven't been able to get accurate data for the following years, but no sign that this has changed. 50,000 metric tons of those products were landfilled in Europe for the entire industry. So 50,000 metric tons, it's really huge. You take a soccer field, you can pile up to 2.5 meters of those units. Just for this industry, just for Europe, just for one year. And we do think at Lexmark that this should be reduced to zero because there is no way that we, we lose all this resource. Here, when we landfill such kind of resource, we landfill precious, precious uh, uh, material, uh, plastic, and many things that we can recover. Or we also can reuse some of the parts or reuse some of the product, which is even better because it's higher in the waste hierarchy. So what do we do at Lexmark toward this target to reduce it to zero? Uh, we have a program which aims to collect uh, our product at the end of life stage. And as of today, we've been successful to collect 40 plus percent of the unit we put on the market. So each time we put 100 product on the market, we collect back 40% of it, 40 of, uh, of them. Uh, could we do more? Yes, we could do more. So far, we are facing difficulties to do more uh, because it also depends on willingness of our customer to return us those products. Even if it's for free, we face difficulties to get more return of those products. And as soon as these products are returned to us, uh, we ensure that there is zero landfill and less than 3% energy recovery. And the energy recovery, by the way, is on toner, so the ink itself, which is made of carbon black mainly, and for which we haven't found any uh, good or sustainable way uh, to, to dispose. So how do we do in a bit more details? Uh, I'm not here to market Lexmark. Um, I don't have any marketing hat, but I think it's important to, to explain you how it works in very few words. I like to say that it's part of the DNA of the company. For 20 plus years, without calling it circular economy, we used to do circular economy. Uh, we were calling it remanufacturing at that time. So for 20 plus years, when a design engineer put together uh, the drawing of a new pro product, he do so not for the purpose of being manufacturable, which is obvious. We need to be able to manufacture the, the product would be the easiest way, the most cost efficient way, but also for the purpose of being remanufacturable because he knows that six months later, the first product will come back to be remanufactured. So it's really part of the DNA. And this is something which is not rocket science. You just use more screw and less glues. It, it is that basic. And we are doing this for 20 plus years. Uh, we put in place a program for free, which is called LCCP, Lexmark Collection Cartridge Program, uh, which aim is to collect the product for free uh, at our customer premises. So we deliver them with an empty uh, cardboard container on which there is a QR code. We dispose of their empty product into the cardboard container. And when it's full, they just scan with their smartphone the QR code and it triggers automatically the pickup of the full uh, container and the delivery of an empty one. And as soon as it is done, uh, it is shipped to, to our sorting center where we treat it, making sure that there is no, no landfill and, uh, and everything which can be recovered is recovered. So first we remanufacture, then we reuse part when we can't remanufacture the product itself. So remanufacture side slash refurbish, by the way. And then things that we cannot remanufacture or reuse, we, we recycle them, making sure that there is no landfill. So the case itself, let's look back at 2012. 0% uh, of the product we were sourcing, we were selling in Europe, sorry, were sourced in the EU. 0%. Everything was coming from China and, uh, and Mexico. Happen what happened? There's been a decision at the head of the company to analyze how we could do as much as possible regional and how can we set up regional manufacturing in Europe. 
I had the chance to lead the effort to determine the feasibility of such uh, activity. Uh, but the purpose of it was, I mean, we are in business. So the purpose was not only to be more green, to be more circular. Uh, there was an obvious purpose to enhance the customer service that we were proposing and uh, the customer satisfaction. But most, most than, uh, than that, it was a cost benefit. So uh, the challenge has been to make an EU country or even a European country more competitive than China or Mexico. On a pure manufacturing cost, of course, forget about it. Even if labor is going up at a two-digit rate per year, even if the, the freight cost is going up significantly from far uh, Southeast Asia to, to Europe, the projection was showing that the gap was still too high to close in few years. So of course we work a total cost of ownership, uh, adding the cost of bearing up, um, of having inventory on the ocean as well as in the warehouse, additional safety stock, cost of exped uh, expediting product, and so on and so on. We try to be as creative as possible and end up with a neutral type case, which was not sufficient to convince our executive uh, to invest in, in the project. Uh, so we scratch our hair and we end up adding circular economy benefits. And I explain, we had already this LCCP program to collect our empty product. And then we were shipping those products back to Mexico to be sorted and recycled and uh, remanufactured, sorry, and then recycled ultimately. Uh, and our plan here was just about manufacturing, reshoring manufacturing. So we worked with engineers and tried to determine how we could on the same line with a very minimum investment do remanufacturing on the same line than remanufacturing. So we worked together and end up with a proposal that, well, yes, it can be done. It can be done at about no additional cost, but the benefit it would drive are pretty significant because when you recover an empty product and you reuse it, you just have to change few parts uh, to test it, to refill it with toner, and uh, you save a significant amount of, uh, of money. And on a circular economy viewpoint, it's highly positive. So this is what I mean by circular economy. So thanks to this circular economy uh, item, the case swing to be positive. So where are we today? <clears throat> These are actual data from last year, 2019. About 70% of the product are sourced in the EU with the benefit that you can see here on the top left corner. Uh, of course, environmental be benefit uh, in terms of CO2, CO2 impact. Uh, obvious business benefit because the decision was taken based on cost savings, but as well as customer service uh, benefits, which are not neglectable at all, far from that. Our customers are pretty excited to see that the product they buy are made in the EU. And by the way, it's a real made in the EU. It's not just a rubber stamping. Uh, I mean, about all the bit of material is manufactured in the EU, is made in the EU. So all the component, uh, most of the components are coming from the EU and are all assembled in the, in the EU. And obvious job creation, uh, several hundred uh, job creation. We are shooting for more next year with 75% and additional benefit, as you, as you can see here, obvious one. And all this thanks to the circular economy benefit. My point here is that all those numbers in terms of environmental benefit, uh, cost saving that I couldn't size it uh, for confidentiality purpose, but job creation, of course, they are not all linked just to the circular economy uh, piece. But without a circular economy benefit, all this reshoring wouldn't have been positive. And this is the beauty of this, uh, of this case, in my, uh, in my opinion. So one of the questions you may have is, what about procurement involvement? So not easy in a webinar to, to interact with the, with the audience. I therefore put together on the next chart what I do see as takeaways, and I will spend a couple of minutes to, to go a bit in more details on the takeaway and what, uh, what I think is important for, for us as procurement professional. 
The first takeaway here is a procurement positioning. Uh, if I look at my role, uh, as it is described on a piece of paper, there is nothing related to circular economy. Uh, I'm not the one who should have, who, who, who should have driven the, the business case here. But based on my know-how, I've been asked to provide some data, some thought, and step by step, I took naturally the lead on the, on the effort, and I've been asked to lead the entire project and to put everything to, together. Uh, so I've been the, the coordinator for the business case, working on estimates. Uh, reshoring manufacturing activity is quite a complex case and putting everything on scope of work to get quotes from our customer, uh, from our suppliers would have been uh, quite a challenge and even a nightmare, I would say, at the end. So we elected uh, to work on estimates based on the, on the labor rate of the various countries uh, in Europe, based on the labor content, based on the space that we were uh, estimating, energy consumption, overhead, and so on. We built the case ourselves before presenting it to our executive. Challenge afterward has been to make sure that the quote we were getting uh, would not be higher than our estimate, and make sure that our estimate was not too high so it would kill the case. Um, then the learning is a real total cost of ownership. Me having an MBA from the EIPM, I thought I knew by heart what a TCO is. And I, I would say that I'm now acting with more humility because uh, I was far from thinking about this circular economy uh, benefit that we identify that helps the case. Uh, for me, it would have been easy, uh, let's say, to kill the case uh, very quickly. Uh, showing that, well, there is no way a country in Europe can be more competitive than China or Mexico. Uh, put the number together, uh, get reviews and everything nodding to say, yes, we agree, we understand, next case. Uh, but based on the passion I had around uh, circular economy and few people around me had uh, on the subject matter, the story has been different. Then the supplier selection lead, uh, some obvious uh, element that you can see here. I think one of the force of the project has been to work with a cross-functional team made of people coming also from, from manufacturing, as an example, sustainability, uh, as well as finance, which help a lot to build the case and to embark everybody here. Uh, and me as a procurement professional, I, I didn't thought that I would face a situation in my in my professional life, but uh, I did, and I've, it, it's a quick story. Um, when we've been at the supplier selection stage, I've been told by uh, the, the engineer community who has been approached by uh, some supplier, and specifically one, uh, well, we know which supplier we want. We want this supplier. So do whatever you want to do. Uh, on a procurement viewpoint to tick the box to make sure that we are compliant with the policy, but this is the supplier that we want. And I say, well, yes, but if I do my procurement job, I will bring on the table various suppliers, various cases, and then we have to decide as a team and not only engineers, which supplier is the most, uh, is a better place one. And guess what, at the end, we end up with a different supplier than the one which was uh, the preferred one at the early beginning. And this is, in my opinion, thanks to the cross-functional team we work with, but also a matrix that we develop and which is on the next chart, which is this one. No, nothing rocket science here. On this column here, you have the various attributes that we all agreed on in a brainstorming session to say, well, all these are important parameters for the choice of our supplier. Okay, good. Then now let's sort them out depending on the, on the weight. And of course there is cost. But guess what? If you look here, the cost is only 10%. 10% out of 100. Uh, and then we had the shortlist of supplier, free supplier in the shortlist, and we ranked them one, two, three, uh, or ex echo uh, as on this first line. And then we did some basic math, the weight times the rating to end up to a, to a score. And the one having the highest score uh, is the one who should have been selected. 
And naturally, we all agreed that the one who had the highest score was the one who uh, should be selected. And this grid, believe me or not, was done before we get any quote from any supplier, uh, which I think helps a lot uh, in our process. So few KSF to come to finish my presentation, uh, three KSF. The first one is passion. Um, this case, as I mentioned, it could have been uh, closed and dead very quickly. Uh, but we've been few passionate people. Yep. And I had in my management light, line passionate people who brought support. And this has been a, a really key success factor. The next one is action. Uh, really need to to move on, even if it's out of your scope, out of procurement scope, or it looks to be out of procurement scope, uh, just move on. Just knock at the door of the of various people. And I've been surprised to see uh, how easy it's been to get some traction and some interest from various people, whether they were from marketing, from finance. Uh, circular economy environment is closer to people's heart in business than we think about, or at least than what I was thinking about. And last KSF is I think it's important to be a change agent, especially for us as procurement professional, navigating into a company where there is a lot of change. And these days change is faster than uh, decades ago is already a challenge. But when you have to connect two entity where there is change all the time, it's really uh, a challenge. And we do, I think we do have to be really at ease with change and to be what I call a change agent here uh, to ensure success in such kind of, uh, of story. Uh, and to see things differently from a different angle, to pull the circular economy or the environmental aspect uh, differently than what we would do business as usual, I would say. So now, last question for you, based on what you you heard. I guess there are a few things which pop up in your mind on what you in your role can do, would like to do, uh, what you can initiate to better take into consideration circular economy aspect. Take just a few seconds to, to think about it and take some notes for yourself. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope this presentation has been inspiring and will uh, drive you to make some more path uh, on the circular economy uh, way. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks a lot for this uh, very, very, very interesting uh, uh, project, but also um, showing also from from your hand, you know, your experience with the topic and sharing your passion on the topic. Any any questions? Any kind of reactions? Whatever they are. Um, yes, Diego. We will be sending some of the, uh, the some of the slides. No problem with that. Any other point? I think this morning we had uh, we had a question about the um, the barriers. So um, implementing. Um, uh, sustainable procurement, uh, implementing uh, um, any things like uh, 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 circular economy. Wh wh what would you see, Patrick, as being some of the uh, most classic barriers and how to solve them? I mean, one obvious one is, is really cost because um, uh, we are all in business and these days it's even tougher than it used to be. Uh, cost is a clear barrier. Um, but most of the time, I mean, uh, looking at the experience um, I do have on the subject matter, I think the barrier is mainly the boundaries that we put ourselves. Uh, maybe easy to say, but uh, I think this is a, a significant barrier after cost. Yeah, I think, you know, this is really something that uh, we see everywhere is the, uh, we tend to have... Uh, different functions we have a specialty in terms of uh, 
uh, point of attention. So uh, some departments are uh, looking at the quality, other departments are more focused on cost, and and really the uh, the barrier is the uh, this kind of a mono mono focus, you know, and uh, the world of management, the world of uh, uh, future development is about reconciling some of these tensions, you know, finding a way to reconcile cost and quality, finding a way to reconcile uh, cost and environment, finding a way to reconcile risk and the social performance. And, uh, and I think that's uh, interesting because when we try to uh, find ways to address uh, contradictory forces, this is also pushing us to look at the world with different pair of glasses. And that's where, you know, some of the creativity is coming out, is uh, uh, if we were just looking at everything we buy only from a cost perspective, we would see a number of opportunities. But as soon as we look at it from different angles, we create opportunity to see uh, things uh, from a multiple angle. And, and therefore, you know, surprise, surprise, sometimes, you know, we can have uh, two perspectives that can mutually support each other. Yeah, and I would add lack of curiosity paradigm that we all have. Uh, again, I've been surprised touching base with people from different area within the company to see how close the subject matter can be to people's heart. Uh, but I have the paradigm that this will, will have, we will have no traction from anyone on, on this one. Uh, this one trigger much interest. And it's really the other way around. So, uh, yeah, be curious, share things, thoughts, even crazy thoughts, uh, and you'll see what you'll end up with. It can't hurt you. It can't hurt anyone. Great. Any final questions, reactions? Any uh, point of view from the audience? Or maybe someone wants to share some of the its finding or takeaway? Maybe. Let's see. It's very quiet. Friday. End of the week. Very soon. For Europe. Still half a day for South America and America. Ah, we got one. So thank you. This was uh, thanks for sharing. Thank you. This was my first approach to the subject. Well, great if you've been able to, you know, bring some of these uh, some of these concepts. Um, I think we need to um, continue to equip um, both, you know, uh, practitioner with both kind of a set of glasses, you know, that help to spot some of these opportunities. And at the same time, you know, just to keep insisting on the importance of, uh, you know, the personal engagement, the uh, the change logic that we need to bring uh, together uh, on these on these two topics. That's really the uh, the combination that can help us to get into actions and and get some result. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of people see that as uh, we talk about it, but we need to do more. You know, practical things. Thank you, Patrick, for joining. Just, uh, just to say, today we've received, uh, you know, we've delivered the copies of uh, um, our new book uh, from the IPM, Fifth Generation Purchasing. And there is a whole section on sustainability uh, with an interview from uh, Patrick, um, where he's uh, sharing some of his perspective and uh, also some element from the case. So. Thank Patrick for uh, you know being with us on this uh, journey. Um, that's uh, all about you know creating value, not just for uh, from an economic standpoint, but uh, value from uh, uh, everyone around. Thank you, Anush. Thank you.